Friends in Christ, there are moments in our life which we would hope to last a little bit longer. Some years ago, after the Chicago Cubs had finally ended their drought of a World Series, the city of Chicago had shut down. I was not a big Chicago Cubs fan, not really yet today, but my children both are. And I was amazed at how long a major city could celebrate a World Series championship like that. But eventually, the city had to get back on its feet, and the celebration of the World Series champion is for many now a forgotten memory. Yeah, we kind of like those moments of joy to last a little bit longer, but uh, that's all they are, they're just moments. And then there's also the moments of sorrow, where I've been at funeral homes, and I know funeral directors, and pastors, sometimes have a problem to figure out how to take the family away from the casket as it needs to be closed for the last time. They don't want the moment to end. Yes, joyful moments and sorrowful moments are some moments we would hope to maybe be eternal or at least last a little longer than they do. But I guarantee you one thing this morning that I'm sure that you all would agree with there's one thing for sure you don't want to last for a long time, and that is church, <laughs> right? You know, no matter how good the preacher is, he'll begin to drone on after a while. Sounds monotonous. No matter how good the organist is, how good the hymns are, you get tired of singing them. You just got other things to do on Sunday than being to church for a long time. And so when things get a little bit lengthy, you start looking at your watch, playing with your cell phone, beginning to yawn, maybe even nod off, hoping that somebody, preferably the pastor, might notice and get you out of your misery. <laughs> yes, we sometimes wonder why we don't enjoy worship for a long, long time. I had a student in my eighth grade classroom back in Davenport, Iowa. One time during his study break, he raised his hand. He said, Mr. Rayla, may I approach your desk? And I said, Rick, come forward. Rick was a troubled child. He had a troubled family. He was a troubled kid in school. But for some reason, he and I had a rapport. And the principal would send me after him if he got in trouble because I had maybe some gift to settle him down. So he came to my desk and he said, Mr. Rayla, is it, is it true that we're going to worship in heaven forever? I said, Rick, that's what it says in the Bible. He shook his head. He said, Mr. Rabel, I have a hard time doing it for an hour. <laughs> we struggle on this side of time understanding how worship could be forever in heaven. But today's gospel reading maybe gives us a little bit of an insight of how beautiful it's going to be. You know, Peter, James, and John, three of Christ's chosen disciples, are taken up to this mountaintop experience with Christ. And there before him, before them, he is transfigured. His face changes, his clothing changes, his whole demeanor, and it's his whole substance of being becomes glorified before them. And then they see two other figures named Moses and Elijah. They sit there and they're conversing and they're talking. What are they conversing about? Luke says they're talking about Jesus' departure into Jerusalem that he is going to go into the city of Jerusalem to suffer and die for the sins of the world. Now, Peter wakes up after being a little bit of sleepy and seems to be excited about the event and he wants this treasured moment to last forever. So he says, Master, it is good for us to be here. Not in the fact that he can contribute something to the scene, but it's good for him to be in this glorious presence. And can we make this last a little bit longer? I've got an option. Let's build three tabernacles. One for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you so that you can all stay here. We'll never have to leave this glorious experience, this mountaintop enjoyment of life. Let's all just stay here. You don't need to go to Jerusalem and suffer and die. Let's just stay and bask in your glory. You see this thing about the tabernacles, it opens our eyes up a little bit when you look at the Old Testament tabernacle. If you've done some research on it, inside the tabernacle, there's part of this area called the Holy of Holies. 
and only the high priest was able to enter the Holy of Holies once a year, once a year to atone for the sins of the people. And the tabernacle had no windows. The tabernacle had no candles in the Holy of Holies. But the high priest would tell you, there's a glorious bulb of energy dwelling in the Holy of Holies, a light that exists on its own. It was an amazing miracle that the people of Israel saw. God's glory dwelling in their tabernacle. And Peter is hoping maybe, just maybe, if we build these tabernacles, this glory, like in the Old Testament, will never have to leave. But Jesus said, no, the glory must be veiled again. I must go into the city of Jerusalem, go from the mountaintop of experience in the depths of the valley of sorrow as I suffer and die for the sins of Peter, James, and John, and for all of us, so that one day, this moment of basking in the God's glory will be eternal. Jesus veils the glory up, zips it up again, and heads back into the Jerusalem to suffer and die for our sins. And so we are approaching the season of Lent. Transfiguration celebrated right now before Ash Wednesday. Because we're about to do something that the world hates. We're about to do something that our sinful flesh just truly despises. And that is to take a really, really good hard look at what's inside of ourselves. Because scripture tells us that what's inside of ourselves is not something we're going to like to see. It's not going to be a pleasant thing. And yet, there are pastors and there are churches in the world that's out there all talking about the power of positive thinking. That you need to look yourself in the mirror and say, I'm a good person. I'm capable of doing this. But scripture says something contrary. That when we look in the mirror as Christians, we should all have the experience of St. Paul who said this when he looked in the mirror. For I know that nothing Nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. See, our flesh doesn't like to hear that. The world doesn't like to hear that. And yet the church says it's a healthy thing for us to do. For thousands of years, the church has been celebrating this walk in the season of Lent so that we can take a good, hard look at ourselves and recognize that nothing good dwells in us and that any hope for wholeness comes not from within, it comes from without in Christ Jesus. Forty days we reflect on this. Forty days between Ash Wednesday and Easter, we take a good, hard look and ask ourselves, why does Jesus have to come? Because there is nothing good that dwells in me. So during the season of Lent, the church encourages a couple things to help us kind of reflect on this time of penance. Number one, they say, remove all the lewdness. So it is customary for six weeks to not sing an alleluia until Easter. It is customary in the church, which more churches now have just kind of dismissed not to put flowers on the altar during the season of Lent. Because uh, they felt that flowers are a sign of the resurrection. We're going to celebrate the resurrection with a lot of flowers on Easter Sunday. So to help truly appreciate that message of symbolism, take the flowers off for six Sundays. Not really followed much by churches today. And then there's the recommendation that no Christian weddings be done during the season of Lent. Because usually the sanctuary is not going to communicate a sense of joyful experience for a wedding. So these things, are, these things are what the church recommends during the season of Lent. But thanks be to God, he does not recommend that we ever lose the word and the sacraments. Thanks be to God for that. That in the means of grace, God continues to share with us the good news, especially when we look inside of ourselves and says, there's nothing good here, but thanks be to God, God forgives me. God restores me in Christ Jesus. The word and the sacrament tell me that. Yes, they, they tell you the law, but they also share with you the great gospel of Christ, of what he's accomplished for you. That's the blessing of having these things every Sunday. Word and sacrament reminding of these great things of God's love for us. 
You know, some, a couple years ago, I had a conversation with an individual at Men's Breakfast up there in Indiana. And uh, one of the comforting things he told me was something that I treasured because he said, oh, well, he must have been listening to some sermons or some catechetical instruction I've done some years ago. His name was Tim Schultz. And uh, he was talking about the various way churches do things in this men's breakfast. And he, he said, Pastor, he said, uh, regardless of what other things do, what other pastors do, he said, we've got this great thing. He said, uh, he said this, it was humorous, but yet very deep. He said, you can preach a tank of a sermon, but we still got the sacrament. Think about that. But no matter how bad the pastor is preaching, you still got this. You still got this. No matter how bad those hymns are during the season of Lent, you still got this. You still got that. We've got it, people. We've got treasures here. And we need to begin to emphasize our strengths as not just Christians, but as Lutherans, proclaiming what good news God has for us in the Word and Sacrament, even when the preacher's a little bit off his game. During the sacrament, when I was a little kid, my dad was the preacher, he would take the veil off. As you can see, the elements are veiled. And altar guilds are very good at polishing and maintaining the communion ware. And when my father would take off the veil, you know, the sanctuary chancel area is lit so much that you would see reflections off the silver, and I would see these little sparkles. And I would say as a little kid, oh, something special is going on. Something really significant is happening here. I really didn't understand, but just how the church had set things up, I began to understand something is significantly happening here. And as I grew, I began to understand in the Word and Sacrament, we get the Peter, James, and John experience. Mountaintop experience with Jesus. Glory of God. Here today, veiled in bread and wine. Veiled in spoken human word. We have the mountaintop experience this morning. And then after the sacrament is over, notice what the elder and pastor do. They veil the elements again. Just like the veil that God's glory, the glory of Christ was veiled, after he had his mountaintop experience. So again, when it's all said and done, the glory of God veiled before us because we have to leave this mountaintop experience to head out back into the plain, out through those doors. Because there's people that you know that need to hear about Jesus. There's people that you can share the gospel of Christ with so that they too can have the experience we did, the experience that leads us to this truth that St. Paul proclaims in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. How blessed you are to have that experience, to see God's glory in Jesus. Now share that blessing with others. During this side of time, we are going to go up and down in Christ, with Christ. There will be moments where we'll really be having great glorious experiences in worship or in life where we'll be giving God thanks and praise. The glory of God has really blessed me today. And then there are some times in life where we're kind of wondering where any glory's at when we seem to be so much in darkness. It's going to be a journey, people, until the end of time. Mountaintop, valley, mountaintop, valley, mountaintop, valley. But one day, it'll only be mountaintop experience. And when we get there, we will begin to ask some things, probably what we thought of in the past. I mean, on this side of time, we kind of wonder, how can we enjoy worship forever? But when we get on that side of time, we're going to wonder how we could have even asked that question. In his name, amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.